So our third mechanism of exchange of genetic material happens via transduction. Transduction is when a virus infects a cell and transfers DNA from a previous host cell. Now, we're talking about exchange of bacterial DNA, so we're not specifically talking about the infection of the viral DNA, but we're talking about DNA that gets transferred when a virus infects another cell. So general outline of transduction, a bacteria, I'm sorry, a virus has infected a cell. In this case, we've got our bacteriophage infecting a bacterial cell. And um, as part of this process, pieces of host DNA can be incorporated into the DNA that is transferred when a virus replicates. So when this virus replicates, it might pick up a piece, you can see this little red bit here, it might pick up a piece of DNA from that host cell and then take it with it to the next cell and transfer both the viral DNA and the new DNA that came from the previous host cell. Now this happens because when viruses replicate, they take their uh, their own DNA, replicate their own DNA, use the cell to produce more viruses and then take any DNA that's encapsulated in that virus package into the next cell. So um, this is sort of general transduction. We won't go into too much more detail than this, but we are going to take a break here and talk about viruses and how this virus actually picks up this piece of host DNA. So viruses are essentially just a little packet of nucleic acids. So there are different forms, but they are a at the most basic level, a protein coat or an envelope, an outside protein filled with nucleic acid. That's it. So there are different forms, different types of viruses, but all viruses are basically nucleic acid surrounded by this protein coat. Viral genomes can be DNA or RNA, and they can be double-stranded or single-stranded. So we can have double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA viruses, double-stranded RNA, or single-stranded RNA viruses. So we have all possibilities here. Um, viruses are going to contain a single piece of DNA or RNA um, that it contains anywhere from three, the smallest viruses contain only three genes, to a thousand genes or several thousand genes, depending on how complex their coat is and what they're actually doing for the cell or to the host cell. So the genes that are encoded in the virus um, co encode information for replication of the genome and for producing the components of that virus, the, the protein coat and any other pieces of its physical structure. Um, these genes do not encode the ability of this virus to replicate itself. It encodes the genes for replication, but it doesn't have the machinery to actually replicate its genome without a host cell. So when a virus infects a host cell, it takes over the molecular machinery and uses it to reproduce its own genetic material and the components to make that piece or that to make that virus. So here's an example or a list of some example viruses. Uh, you definitely don't need to memorize this. I just wanted to give you an example um, of some um, common viruses, um, DNA versus RNA viruses. Um, so you might recognize some of these uh, chicken pox, smallpox, herpes, um, sore throat, warts, uh, flu, rabies, things like that. And of course, now we have this COVID virus, COVID-19. This is a group from a group called the coronaviruses. Um, and they are um, sort of the, the ones in the news right now. But there are many, many types of viruses, um, including um, AIDS, 
uh, yellow fever. So you guys get the idea. There are many different types of viruses and they can be both DNA or RNA. Um, there are huge range of severity. So we've got everything from just a common cold uh, that might make you just feel kind of gross for a day or two, um, all the way to um, sort of life threatening um, things like yellow fever, meningitis, um, things like that. So viruses infect all life forms. They are generally not really considered living themselves. Um, they um, contain all of the information for replication, for um, proliferation, um, but they can't do it on their own. So they're generally not considered alive themselves, but they do um, infect all life forms. There's a huge range of types of viruses with very distinct shapes. Um, we've got this tobacco mosaic virus. This infects the tobacco plant that is uh, sort of a cylindrical shape virus. We've got um, these viruses that are kind of round or um, icosahedral. Um, and then they often have these little recognition um, proteins on the outside, some um, type of protein or molecule that allows them to recognize their host cell. Um, over here, we've got a bacteriophage. These are viruses that infect bacteria. Um, the most commonly studied one is the T4 bacteriophage that it infects E. coli. And um, this has been very extensively studied uh, because it's easy to isolate. E. coli is easy to get. E. coli viruses are easy to get and to study. Uh, general structure of this bacteriophage, since this is what we're gonna focus on, is this head or uh, capsid, um, I'm sorry, that's not the capsid, um, the head that contains the DNA or the RNA, whatever nucleic acid it happens to contain. Um, this one also has this structure, the collar and tail um, that sort of um, work to inject the DNA into the bacterial cell, and then it's got these tail fibers, or almost like legs, that help it attach to the bacteria. So this gives it sort of a support system, and then it basically pumps or injects its DNA into the bacterial cell. So uh, general structure of the virus, you've got that um, protein outside the capsid, uh, which is going to be a series of uh, proteins that make the outer membrane. Um, and then you're going to house the genetic material inside. Um, some viruses are circular. Um, some have other shapes. Some are also enclosed by an envelope, which is sort of a protective layer, a lipid bilayer on the outside that is actually made from the host cell. So um, it actually uh, not only uses the cell to produce its components, but actually takes part of the cell along with it. All right, so there are two major uh, sort of life cycles of a uh, bacteriophage or of uh, any virus. Um, we've got the lytic cycle and then we've got a second one called the lysogenic cycle. So we're going to start with the lytic cycle. In the lytic cycle, the, uh, the virus infects the bacterium or the cell, takes over its molecular machinery, um, and then bursts or lyses, lyse means to break, lyses the cell and releases the viruses to go on and infect a new cell. So the phage attaches to the cell, it recognizes the cell, it pumps its DNA into the cell. That DNA is then um, replicated or I'm sorry, well, yes, replicated, but also that DNA is expressed by ribosomes that are present 
in the cytoplasm of that bacterial cell. So it actually uses the bacterium's native ribosomes to express the DNA. Remember, ribosomes are our structures in the cell that um, do translation. So they take the mRNA information and turn it into a protein. So this is how we actually use the cell's machinery to um, express the genes encoded in that um, in that uh, virus. So once those ribosomes start expressing the proteins, um, they're going to express all of those proteins that the phage requires. So we're going to start to see the components being built um, of this of this bacterium. Um, during this process, the host cell's DNA is degraded. So essentially, this cell cannot reproduce its own DNA anymore. It just becomes a little factory to produce these new viruses. Um, also encoded in those genes are instructions for assembling these proteins. I'm sorry, these, um, well, yes, the virus proteins um, into functional phage um, structures and then once this is complete it's going to cause the rupture of the cell and each of these viruses can go on and infect another cell so here we have a picture of a lawn of bacteria so this whole plate is covered with bacteria and these little dots are called plaques and those plaques are uh, basically um, spots where those cells that were there have been infected and now they've died because once that virus breaks open the cell it then infects the cell next to it and so if we were to let this continue we would see bigger and bigger plaques as that virus spreads out from the site of infection So this slide, um, you don't need to memorize this, but I really like it because it um, shows how the different nucleic acids are used to um, actually take over, or how that nucleic acid is actually expressed um, through the takeover of these cells. Um, so for example, double-stranded DNA um, transcription occurs on one or both strands just like the cellular genes in the host genome um, and then there's some examples of viruses that do that um, if it is an rna virus um, that rna can either um, be used directly in translation so that rna can be used as messenger rna immediately for translation um, in other viruses that strand is actually um, the template and so um, instead uh, you actually have to make the sense strand or the coding strand first from that template and then make the messenger RNA. So there's a variety of ways in which these viruses work. So our second life cycle of uh, bacteriophages or other viruses is the lysogenic phase. So the lysogenic phase is sort of a combo lifestyle where um, the virus can either cause the cell to burst, just like the lytic cycle, or it can actually um, sort of enter this dormant life cycle where the bacterial DNA is incorporated into the genome of the host organism. So let's say we have our bacterium. It is infected by the virus. So the virus attaches, infects the cell with its DNA. Now from here, this cell can either enter the lytic cycle, which is exactly what we talked about before, where the um, virus genome takes over the host cell, breaks down the host DNA, makes the components for the virus, and then the virus lyses the cell and infects another cell. In viruses that go through the lysogenic phase, at this point after infection, um, 
the virus can actually sort of be repressed. So it doesn't infect any more cells. And instead, an enzyme called integrase is actually going to insert that virus genome into the genomic DNA of this host cell. So then this cell just sort of goes on its merry way. Um, it continues um, binary fission or mitosis, whatever the case may be, and replicates that viral genome. Then at some point, it actually can um, sort of break out of this lysogenic cycle and become lytic. And so when it becomes lytic, it takes over the cell's machinery, codes for the virus, packages the virus, then lyses the cell and infects other cells. So the virus that enters this genome is actually called a prophage, not prophase, like in mitosis, prophage. This prophage um, is integrated indefinitely. So as long as that cell is dividing and growing, it's gonna pass on that viral information. Now, some viruses are called temperate phages. These are viruses that can replicate with and um, release new viruses without killing the host cell. So essentially, they can continue to infect the organism as long as that organism and its cells are living. Now this lysogenic cycle, um, and one example of this is the herpes virus. So this is why um, people can have um, cold sores, like the herpes virus on your lips, um, can have cold sores that sort of um, flare up. So um, you become infected, the virus enters the lysogenic cycle and just hangs out in the genome for a while, and then at some point is activated and um, turns lytic, which is how you get those cold sores, and then the, the virus will go um, lysogenic again, enter that lysogenic cycle. So this is why people with the herpes virus um, can sort of continually be reinfected and continually have new sores. So we talked about um, the virus life cycle. So let's go back to transduction. Now, when that viral DNA is integrated into that genome, let's say that the blue is the viral DNA, and our host, once the cell goes back to the lytic cycle, our host DNA is going to be cut up. Now, when that DNA is cut up and when that viral genome is packaged, sometimes you might get little bits of the host genome that get packaged in with that viral DNA. So when the cell begins to repackage its genome um, for infection, you actually get some of that host DNA. This host DNA, when it is transferred, this is where you get transduction. You get the movement of information from one bacterial cell that has been infected to another bacterial cell who is being infected. And so when this DNA incorporates into the genome, you get the viral genome plus that host DNA from the previous host gets loaded in and then transferred to the new cell. So we've spent a lot of time in this chapter talking about bacteria and viruses. And as you know, viruses infect human cells as well. So just so our eukaryotes don't feel left out, let's talk about um, one of the human viruses, the HIV virus, and how it affects the cell. So the HIV virus has these little uh, recognition proteins on the outside, and they recognize specific cells within our immune system.
So when HIV infects the body, it targets these cells within our immune system, and it does so by this GP120 and GP41 uh, glycoprotein. So once it recognizes the specific cell within our body, it enters that cell. Now HIV is an RNA virus, it's a double-stranded RNA virus, and once it infects the cell, that RNA needs to be turned into DNA. Now it does this by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase produces cDNA or complementary DNA to that RNA strand. And then that complementary DNA is turned into double-stranded DNA within the cell where it is integrated into the host genome. So then when the virus begins to replicate, that DNA is made into RNA again, and that RNA is going to express the genes for that virus to produce new HIV viruses that are then released to infect the host cell. Now you might remember this cDNA from an earlier chapter. We talked about cDNA and this reverse transcriptase is what we use to make it. When we talked about cDNA before, we were looking at a laboratory technique in which we can observe the expressed mRNA sequences. And this allows us to see what genes are being expressed at a particular time in, um, in a cell. Now, in a laboratory, we turn it into DNA. We turn that mRNA into DNA because DNA is much more stable. In the HIV virus, we turn it into DNA so we can incorporate it into the genome.